Morning, everyone. Cheryl, is Councillor Hughes zooming in or calling in? Good morning, Mayor. As far as I know, she's zooming in. Okay. I can see before. her, Kathy. Oh, there she is. Because she called in for something last week, so I'd... I can I can see her, Kathy. They're talking about you, Jackie. No, I was talking about Councillor Hughes. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> with the ledge officers. Hold on. Because I see somebody on the phone now. Is that you, Sheena? Does anyone know who that phone number is? Okay. Hi, Hi Kathy. It's Sheena. Okay, so that's you on the phone? Yeah, it's me on the phone. I can't, okay. I don't have enough internet to do a bandwidth on this without taking everybody else off, off of it, so I'll go black. Okay, no, that's a problem. Um, so I won't be able to see you, so um, either, you probably can't, sh and can you chat while you're on the phone? Like Nothing, but what I'll do, Cassie, is I'll just text you, I'll just say hi, and that just means I want to talk or something. So I send you a text, how about that? Okay, I'll watch my phone for that, okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, it's nine o'clock. We might as well get started. Uh, I'll call this meeting to order. Uh, we have everyone in attendance except for Councillor Mackay. The short notice uh, didn't allow him to participate. He actually had some um, an appointment that he could not get out of. So uh, he is excused for today. So we have everyone but Councillor Mackay. And we have a um, motion in front of us. Can I have? Normally I go to Councillor Mackay for a motion to adopt the agenda, so I'll have to lean on somebody else. <laughs> Councillor, oh, thank you, Councillor Hansen, go ahead. You're muted, Jackie. I know. <laughs> I just, uh, I shouldn't have said that because I'm not organized here to do it, but here I go. Um, that the July 27th, 2020 special council meeting agenda be adopted as presented. Thank you. All those in favor? Uh, in favor. Unanimous, perfect. All right. There's not much on the agenda today, just one thing. Um, and we're, Percy, do you have a presentation for us? Yes, we do have a presentation for you. Okay, awesome, take it away. So, so uh, good morning, um, Mayor Heron and councillors. Uh, we're here today to provide you some information with the, uh, to help uh, with the discussion on mandatory face coverings. We'll share data on the current trends regarding COVID and share information that we have on what's happening throughout the region, as well as uh, in Alberta and in Calgary. Once this presentation is complete, we'll try and answer any of the questions you might have on this complex topic. Although the Medical Officer of Health could not be at Council today, they provided administration with uh, a couple of research reports regarding medical and non-medical masks, and those were provided to, to you uh, through, through the AR. The Alberta Health Services Scientific Advisory Group Rapid Response Report uh, notes the following, that community mask use is now either encouraged or mandatory in over 80 countries, with many uh, jurisdictions encouraging but not mandating the use of cloth masks. The general Alberta population is returning to community and workplace settings where physical distancing is not always possible which is driving public interest in the use of cloth and non-medical face coverings. 
there's a variety of scientific studies with varying levels of evidence that uh, community use of medical and non-medical face coverings prevent infections. Alberta Health Services notes that several of these study studies had uh, methodological issues. So the research at this moment is somewhat challenging and not complete. And there is a lot of active research in this area. However, that being said, there is limited evidence of harms related to community face coverings wearing. The biggest perceived threat that uh, wearing face, uh, that to wearing face coverings, people would feel comfortable with neglecting physical distancing and hygiene. Other challenges could be facial and skin irritants from wearing face coverings, as well as potential breathing difficulties. The Alberta Health Services Committee recommend, recommends uh, that, uh, that in settings where physical distancing cannot be maintained, medical masks or high quality non-medical masks should be encouraged as a form of protection for those vulnerable to severe COVID-19 infection outcomes. This includes vulnerable populations, which include those over 60 and those with immunodeficiencies and uh, other, uh, other uh, medical conditions. Face coverings do not replace the need for physical distancing and hand hygiene. These remain more important strategies than wearing face coverings. The World Health Organization report they also shared uh, with administration is uh, in this report uh, indicated that studies of influenza and influenza-like illnesses show that uh, symptomatic individuals wearing face, face masks can prevent the spread of such illnesses through droplets. And that's not, not just including COVID-19. The, the World Health Organization states at present time, the widespread use of masks by healthy people in the community setting is not support yet supported by high quality or direct scientific evidence. That said, regardless, the World Health Organization recommends that government should encourage general public use of masks in specific situations. And some of those uh, situations are found in table two of that uh, report uh, for the general population in public settings, such as grocery stores at work, social gatherings, mass gatherings, closed settings, including schools and churches, as a potential benefit for source control using non-medical masks. Also, people living in cramped conditions, such as camp-like settings, as a potential benefit for source control using non-medical masks. Also, general public on transportation, for example, on buses, planes, and trains, as a potential benefit for source control using non-medical masks. And, and also, you know, with vulnerable populations, people aged 60 years or older, people with underlying comorbidities, uh, such as cardiovascular disease and uh, diabetes mellitus, uh, uh, di mellitus and immunosuppression, and as a protection using a medical mask. Also, uh, in community setting, any people who are with symptoms suggestive of COVID-19 as source control. The World Health Organization also identified a series of potential advantages and disadvantages of wearing, wearing, uh, wearing masks. And the advantages they identified were potential, uh, reduced potential exposure risk from infected persons before they develop symptoms, reduced potential stigmatization of individuals wearing face coverings, making people feel like they have a role to play in stopping the spread, and a visual reminder of people to be compliant with other measures, including physical distancing and hand hygiene, as well as providing local enterprise uh, benefits and artistic expressions through mask making. Some of the dis disadvantages that they identified were self-contamination due to manipulation of face masks and touching eyes with contaminated hands, self-contamination where non-medical masks are not changed when wet or soiled, 
potential headache or breathing difficulties, depending on the type of mask used, uh, skin and acne irritations, and a false sense of security and, and not following other practices such as physical distancing hand hygiene. Also difficult communication to uh, hearing impaired persons that rely on lip reading and difficulty wearing for some persons, such as children, elderly, those with mental illnesses and developmentally challenged, or those with underlying health problems or facial trauma. From the beginning of the pandemic, the Calgary region has experienced higher rates of infection due to some our larger outbreaks and earlier uh, notice of, uh, of the COVID in comparison to the Edmonton region. Weekly cases in Calgary have more than doubled from early June, prompting warnings from the, the Chief Medical Officer of Health. On July 21st, Calgary City Council passed a bylaw mandating wearing face coverings in all indoor public spaces. So why was this bylaw created? The bylaw was created to protect the health of the economy and the health of Calgarians. Also to address the concerning increase in active cases and to avoid a potential second wave and in response to feedback from 2,000 local businesses and city operations. Additionally, recent survey data from Calgary indicated that 34% of their residents always wore a face covering in public. 63% would feel safer if face coverings were mandatory on transit, and 74% support making face coverings mandatory. Regarding enforcement, focus was on education and awareness, so signage, social media, etc. And enforcement was conducted by municipal enforcement with no expectations for private businesses or city staff to enforce. The fines were are $100 for people who don't wear a mask were required and $200 for businesses failing to display proper signage on masking. Exceptions in the, this bylaw include children under the age of two years, persons with underlying medical conditions or disabilities which inhibit their ability to wear face coverings, persons who are unable to place or use or remove face coverings without assistance, persons who are eating or drinking at public premises that offer food or beverage services, so restaurants, persons engaging in an athletic or fitness activity, persons who are caregiving or accompanying a person with a disability where wearing a face covering would hinder the accommodation of the person's disability, or persons who have temporarily removed their face covering where doing so is necessary to provide or, or remove a service. So things like going to your dentist. In response to uh, uh, in response to development of uh, application of bylaws surrounding the man mandatory and non-mandatory maps in other jurisdictions uh, across Canada and the city of Edmonton developed this decision-making model to help guide decisions on mandating masks in Edmonton. The model identifies five levels, each with corresponding response and triggers. The model relies on fact-based indicators and triggers, as well as meetings with Alberta Health Services and the Zone Emergency Operations Center pandemic team. Edmonton administration will take guidance from Alberta Health Services and the Edmonton Zone Lead Medical Officer of Health recommendations, suggesting, supporting, or recommending mandatory masks, restrictions or closure of city or zone services, programs or facilities, or any other additional methods measures. 
at the July 23rd meeting of Edmonton's Emergency Advisory Committee, City Administration informed Council of the administrative decision to move to level two effective August 1st. People are required to wear face coverings when using public transit and when inside city owned and operated facilities. The exceptions as referenced in your agenda report Edmonton's exceptions closely mirror to what was done in Calgary that we discussed earlier. In both Edmonton and Calgary, when an individual does not, uh, an individual does not need to provide proof of uh, the above to be granted an exception. Enforcement, uh, as this is an administrative uh, directive, it's not enforceable in the same manner as a bylaw and focuses on awareness and education. So the signage, the social media, etc. Individuals choosing not to wear a mask will not be denied service during this time. With regards to city recreation facilities, all restrictions are in alignment with provincial guidelines for sport, physical activity and rec recreation, which means that Face coverings are required in public and common areas, not while exercising or engaging in physical activity. The City of Edmonton's Council will be meeting later this week to discuss whether to move to level three. This move would require a council bylaw and mandate uh, the use of face coverings in all publicly accessible indoor spaces. The enforcement of this bylaw would be undertaken by municipal enforcement. The, all indications are there would be no exceptions for private business or city staff to enforce, and the focus will remain on education and awareness throughout, through signage, social media, and other means. This slide provides an overview of the current status of mandatory face coverings uh, conversations in the Edmonton region. Edmonton obviously has already been discussed. Strathcona County, uh, their emergency advisory committee has a meeting scheduled for tomorrow, July 28th. Spruce Grove, effective August 1st, face coverings will be required on all Spruce Grove transit routes, both commuter and local. All other communities have yet to make a decision on this, on this matter. So Fort Saskatchewan, Beaumont, Leduc, Parkland, Stony Plain, and Sturgeon County. The numbers on this page are taken from the Government of Alberta website and information from Edmonton's presentation to Council. The top graph demonstrates the number of active cases per week for Edmonton and Calgary zones, as well as for the province. The call out boxes identified in the number of new cases in St. Albert, you can see, you can also see that COVID cases for the Calgary region have significantly increased since June 30th where number of new cases are no more stable in the Edmonton region, and there are no new cases in the last couple of weeks for St. Albert. The bottom graph represents the number of new, or the number of active cases for St. Albert from June 2nd. And we're currently at the level of two active cases in the community. Alberta health services leaders across the province recognize the difficulties and challenges of this es escalating situation. And because of this, they're scaling up uh, their emergency coordination center and their zone emergency operations centers, staffing and activities. Currently across the province, there are four provincial and 88 municipal emergency operations centers active. St. Albert maintains a virtual uh, emergency operations center in response to COVID-19. 
this emergency operations center is monitoring the situation and is rapidly able to respond to changes in the situation. As of July 24th, a provincial total of 10,086 people had been confirmed with COVID-19, of which 1,341 cases were active. Two weeks ago, Alberta had 590 active cases. The active, average number of daily cases confirmed this week are 124, compared to 85 the previous week, a 46% increase. Currently, 106 people are in hospital with 21 in, in intensive care units. A total of 8,567 Albertans have now recovered from COVID. There have been 178 deaths in Alberta related to COVID to date, with 13 new deaths reported this last week. On July 24th, 8,735 COVID-19 tests were completed, bringing the total number of tests completed since, since the start of pan, the pandemic to 623,442, and a total of five, 527,149 Albertans have been tested which represents approximately 11.9% of the estimated population of the province of 4,428,247 4, people. The rise in cases is spread across the province and into rural areas. For example, Alberta Health Services Central Zone now has 33 people in hospital and seven in ICU. This was an area that previously had very few cases. As you can see from the orange line on the graph, the number of active cases is trending upward in a similar manner to when original provincial measures of closures were enacted. We're also six months out from when the first COVID case was observed in Canada. As today's council's uh, discussion will likely include the use of mandatory face coverings on public transit, we wanted to share some information on transit uh, with you. As you can see, the overall ridership is down 79% from this time last year. In 2019, student ridership based on the routes to NATE and U of A was 1,796 for the month of August, but in September jumped by 21,483 to a ridership of 23,483. We cannot separate the ridership to Grant McEwen as this is included in the ridership to downtown Edmonton, but with post-secondary schools conducting online learning this fall, we expect these numbers to be significantly impacted and be lower than the previously anticipated numbers. From recent City of Edmonton survey, 71% said making masks mandatory would make them more likely to return to public transit. 31% said that making masks mandatory is the one thing that will make them likely to return to public transit. 76% said that wearing a mask should be mandatory while visiting any indoor public place. And 14% indicated that wearing a mask should not be mandatory. As, as previously mentioned during this uh, uh, presentation, a Calgary survey found that 63% would feel safe, safer if face coverings were mandatory on transit. During the Edmonton Emergency Advisory Committee meeting, the role that uh, public transit plays in getting people to work and children to school was highlighted. Both are necessary for the continued economic recovery from COVID-19. And we are also aware that the province has mandated that schools return uh, to near normal in the fall.
there's a range of of options that uh, could be could be discussed today. Obviously, status quo, take no action, continue to monitor the situation within the city of St. Albert, follow advice and, and guidance of Alberta Health Services and the Chief Medical Officer of Health or Medical Officer of Health. Providing a bylaw mandating face coverings on, on city transit, similar to Spruce Grove. Another option, bylaw mandatory mandating face coverings on city transit and, and in city owned and operated facilities in alignment with the city of Edmonton administrative direction. Option four, a bylaw mandating face coverings in all indoor spaces accessible to the public in alignment with the Calgary bylaw. And another option is, is uh, if the chief medical officer of health mandated face coverings in all indoor spaces accessible to the public. The proposed decision making model was based on the Edmonton criteria, but also is uh, developed on a St. Albert context. The St. Albert outbreak situation is based on information received from the province specific to St. Albert. Currently, there are two active cases in St. Albert with an active case rate of 2.9 per 100,000. There is no facility or business specific outbreaks noted in St. Albert at this time. The city of Edmonton has 198 cases and is at 19.4 per 100,000 overall, but has one area, one uh, community under watch and that community is Duggan with 46 active cases and is identified at a rate of 113.8 per 100,000 based on population. Contrast this with the situation in Calgary, which currently has 577 active cases and a rate of 42.8 per 100,000 uh, globally with four areas under, under a watch. The provincial context is from the relaunch status uh, map, which uh, has three different categories. Open, where no additional measures are required. Watch, where uh, it's above a threshold, but no additional measures. And those, uh, those uh, thresholds are 10 or more cases uh, of COVID with a rate of uh, greater than or equal to 50 per 100,000. And enhanced where additional measures are in place. On the provincial map, St. Albert's status is currently open. Also, Alberta uh, pandemic plan triggers, and those include uh, when the, when the uh, virus was first detected in Alberta. Uh, all, next uh, level is when demand for service starts to exceed available capacity. Also when the pandemic wanes and demand for service falls to more normal levels. A second or subsequent pandemic wave arrives. And finally, when the pandemic is over and normal activities resume. At this point in time, we'd be happy to take your questions and we'll try and answer them as best we can. All right, thank you, uh, Percy. I'm going to actually now go to, we have one registered speaker, which is uh, Jennifer Cotes, Coates. Um, sorry, Jennifer, normally I let uh, the speakers go before the administrative presentation, but um, you fortunate enough got to hear all of that. So I'm gonna give you your five minutes now. You can go ahead whenever you're ready. Wonderful, thank you. I just wanna make sure you guys can hear me okay? We sure can. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to start by thanking you for allowing me to participate today. Um, I'd like to especially thank Councillor Hughes uh, for providing me with the information to speak and uh, for Mayor Heron for allowing me to do so on really short notice. Um, just a quick background. I've been a resident of St. Albert for just over 10 years. My formal background is psychology. However, I've spent the better portion of my professional career working in law firms and supervisory positions with the government of Alberta. Um, I'm not a health expert. However, my education 
did include formal statistical analysis and research design. I'm going to attempt to keep this to five minutes, but it's an important and polarizing topic that I think warrants some fulsome discussion. Though this discussion relates to St. Albert bylaws, I will mention some provincial statistics, because if we limit this to the scope of St. Albert data, which has showed an infection rate of 0.05%, this conversation about mandatory masks kind of loses relevance. Um, symptoms for most are mild to moderate and require no medical information. In, sorry, intervention. We've sorry, pardon me, I lost my train of thought here. So we have we currently have approximately 208 active cases uh, in the geographic areas surrounding St. Albert. Um, to date, we've seen 502 hospitalizations, 102 of which have required ICU care, which is well below provincial capacity. In comparison, the 2018-2019 flu season saw 1,391 hospitalizations. The average age of death from COVID is 83 years old, which is two years higher, two years higher than our provincial life expectancy. 96% of those who have sadly succumbed to this disease have had between one and three other comorbidities. We are not experiencing devastating pandemic we must certainly do what we can to protect those who fall into a high risk category. This brings me to the topic of mandating mask use within the general population. As Percy pointed out, uh, the data right now um, is evolving and at times it's contradictory. So I don't wanna debate the science surrounding mask use. We can all cherry pick data to support whatever position we choose to take on the topic of mask, mask use. I'd rather direct attention to social and legal implications of mandating masks. Before I proceed, I will state that as someone who likes to make data-driven decisions, I would be more likely to support stringent measures surrounding mask use if the science was there. I need not go over guaranteed rights set out under Section 7 of the Charter. I am certain that they are at the forefront of many of the decisions placed in the hands of this very capable council. I am also certain that all members are very aware of your ability to restrict these rights, provided the requirement that any limitations are, and I quote, demonstrably justifiable in a free and democratic society is met. In that respect, I would invite this council to carefully consider if a mask mandate is demonstrably justifiable at this time. The health crisis that was predicted in March and April, thankfully has not come to be our present day reality. As it can be argued that forcing an individual to wear something against their will is a violation of Section 7 if, if challenged in court, the burden of proof would fall upon government and legislators to demonstrate the following. One, prolonged mask usage in community settings is safe and does not pose a health risk to those forced to wear them. The supposition that, sorry, pardon me, two, the supposition that masks can significantly reduce injury and death resulting from COVID when worn by the general public is supported by data and evidence, not assertions. Number three, healthy individuals who display zero symptoms of COVID-19 are capable of transmitting a virus they don't appear to have, therefore should be required to, required to wear masks. I'll repeat that, healthy people with zero symptoms of illness must wear masks. Four, the deeply rooted scientific, scientific credence that herd immunity is often a desired method of controlling disease spread, which by the way, is the very foundation on which our vaccine programs are based, does not apply to COVID-19. Therefore, masks are required to prevent the spread and subsequent development of herd immunity. And number five, overall mask manda mandates will cause more good than they will harm. There is documented evidence that Percy, Percy touched on of the health risks associated with prolonged mask use. Who will assume liability for any damages incurred by those who potentially suffer, either mentally or physically, from mask requirements? Will the government? When a personal choice is removed by edict, responsibility for any damages resulting from that edict must fall somewhere. We must also keep in mind that there are people who an are unable to wear masks for a myriad of mental, physical, and religious reasons. There are people whose health and well being will suffer if forced to comply. Furthermore, should mask bylaws be enacted, 
for what duration will they remain in place? What public health metrics will determine when mask bylaws can be lifted? Currently, as Percy mentioned, St. Albert has two active cases in a population of just over 66,000. To ease bylaw restrictions, do we need to only have one active case, zero cases? An interesting note on this topic. Jennifer, Jennifer, Calgary, I'm have to cut you off because your five minutes is up. So I'll give you like a couple seconds to wrap up, but we can't go over five. Thank you. Um, I just want to end by saying we're, we're seeing mask bylaws in the United States being declared unconstitutional in some jurisdictions. I foresee similar legal challenges mounting from municipalities here. Okay. I say this. Yeah. Can I finish with one quick statement? Thank of you. Course, one I statement. mentioned this not. I mention this not as a veiled threat, but to ensure that you as legislators understand the landscape that is created with these types of law and as keepers of our great democracy and guardians of our fundamental rights, I hope you thoroughly reflect upon your important role as just that. Thank you. Thank you. And we do have uh, legal um, on our call today, so we can have, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions around that as well. Okay, council, it's now it's, um, your turn to ask questions of Percy, of Kevin, of David, whoever you want. So who wants to go first? Look at that. Go ahead. Okay, Councillor Broadhead, then Councillor Jolly. Sorry, can I just ask that Jennifer get muted? I'm getting some feedback. Thank you. Actually, we need to actually uh, put Jennifer over to the YouTube channel now, right? Thank you, okay. All right, go ahead, Councilor Jolly. Sorry, I thought it was Councilor Broadhead oh, first. Broadhead first. Um, okay. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter who goes. Uh, I just, I'd, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, we allowed one person to speak. If we would have allowed, if we would have, if this would have been timely, we can bet we would have had a hundred to speak on both sides of this. So I just need that to be stated up front, given the, given the nature of our uh, emails that we received over the last week and a bit. Yeah, you uh, the, uh, the interesting part about it, uh, and my question to David LaFleur is, what, what is the status of the legal challenge around uh, uh, mandatory face mask use? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Broadhead, I'm not aware that there are any legal challenges extant right now. I think the speaker was raising the specter that there might be, but I'm not aware that there are any currently before the courts. Okay. Well, I some of the some of the data I read it said uh, that there was some legal challenges in Ontario. I'm not sure whether that's what the status of them are, but to the best of your knowledge in Alberta, we don't have any yet. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, fair enough. Uh, through to Percy, I guess the question is, is that, so, and there's a there's a, an abundance of paper on whether people should wear masks or not. The, uh, the desire to wear mask is is uh, is more. Would you say it's more uh, optics of uh, a preventing uh, transmission, or or what? What's the driving uh, consideration here in your mind? Through the mayor to you. Uh, in, in my mind, uh, I think the research kind of shows that wearing a, wearing a mask uh, for the individual uh, makes it so that you're not spreading disease uh, to others. As a, uh, and that's really where the current research is talking. But uh, a lot of it is... Uh, about optically and uh, that reminder to uh, look after look after yourself and uh, others in this in this time in this situation. I truly think health would probably have a, a more clear uh, defined answer on this uh, than than we could have. But in reality, I think it's 
It's about uh, uh, pre preventing the spread to others. So, so if I heard you correctly, then, then the mask use is not so much of preventing uh, the mask wearer from, from uh, harm, it's preventing others from being harmed by the person who's wearing the mask. So in other words, the mask contains whatever I have from spreading to other people. Would that be a fair characterization of that? I think that's a fair characterization. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. All right, Councillor Jolly and then Councillor Hanson. And then Thank you. <laughs> so, so my question is just so if we are requiring masks on transit and city facilities without a bylaw, is that something that, you know, that, that sounds like an OHS kind of decision that we would be making? And by we, I mean, Mr. Scoble would be making um, to protect staff. Is, is that is my understanding of that correct? Maybe, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I might defer to, to David to help a little bit, but my understanding is, you know, certainly with our employees, I can do an administrative directive that all employees will wear masks and that, you know, that's, that's the way that goes, as opposed to, you know, uh, invoking it on transit per se, we, we can do that as administration, but we really don't have any enforcement capability or, or anything like that without a bylaw. So I'm just thinking of, so members of the public saying going in to pay their taxes in person or dog license or whatnot, is administration kind of permitted to say masks are required unless you're exempt, um, kind of without the intervention of council, um, if kind of the data is, is, is leaning toward that being something that can protect our staff. So, yeah, so so we have, you know, we've we we've done a lot of modifications in our, our building specifically for front counter service, which you reference where we're installing um, I guess the barriers and that sort of thing. But as to as to whether we refuse service or not, I guess I I would defer that to David in the absence of pilot. Uh okay. Um if you want to you know, compel public behavior, but you're not prepared to enact a bylaw, you're on, I would say, shaky legal ground. And this is with the greatest of respect to my colleagues in the city of Edmonton. I think you're on shaky legal ground. If you're not going to give yourself a bylaw to back it up, uh, I, I'm, I'm at a loss to understand how you're going to be able to effectively enforce. The Petty Trespass Act has many problems with enforcement. It is a cumbersome, it's like, it's like, it's a very, very awkward uh, instrument to use to try to enforce something like this. And that's all you've got if you don't have a bylaw. So uh, my, my advice would be that if you are interested in trying to make masks mandatory anywhere, whether it's transit, city hall, other city facilities, I would strongly advise you to instruct administration to bring back a bylaw. Thank you. And I guess just my last follow-up questions, and I know, I, I suspect I know the answer to this, but we're confident that the measures we put in place to protect staff, so plexiglass, things like that, are kind of they're they're, they're strong measures. Yes, uh, we've uh, we've got uh, quite a number of uh, measures in place, uh, and they they certainly follow all the uh, health and safety guidance that. Uh, that's out uh, out there. We uh, we can share. Um, here. Cindy's going to share just kind of a, a page on. Oops, sorry. As she as she kind of scans through here. Oops, so it's just dropped. Okay. I'm going so quickly. You're going too quickly. Oh man, since you work this weird weekend. <laughs> so, yeah, but there's there is, we have a number of policies, number of uh, direction pieces in in place that and uh, uh, supplies in place for our staff, whether staff whether it is uh, it is the uh, PPE that's been provided. Uh, whether spatial arrangements uh, have uh, have been made to re redesign the uh, the workplace, or whether uh, shields are in place for for dealing with uh, with, uh, with or or other other staff. So 
those places. So we have the uh, engineered controls as well as the administrative controls in place. Okay, and I guess our very last question, if, if we do find that you know, new information comes in or that, that would suggest that mandatory mass is kind of the best option, would we be able to say copy Calgary's bylaw or copy Edmonton's bylaw and adapt it fairly quickly um, if, if that was warranted kind of with, with new information? Maybe that's a question for David. Uh, through the chair to the Councillor Joey, I'm confident that we could tailor a bylaw to this council's instructions fairly quickly. I mean, if I were told, let's say on day one to have a bylaw ready, I could have it ready for a special council meeting on day three. Let's put it that way. It's not that Great. hard. If, if I could just, if I could just supplement as well, I do have a copy of Edmonton's draft bylaw that I, I received uh, authorization from Edmonton's legal counsel to share with our legal and our, our deputy uh, CAO and, and our DEM, a director of emergency management, if, if council provides further direction. And I guess having read it, it's a, it's a one pager. So it's uh, as Dave, to support David, we could craft something fairly quickly, I think. Great, thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Uh, Councillor Hansen. Then Councillor Watkins, and then I'm going to go to Councillor Hughes. Thank you. Um, actually, uh, David, you answered um, my biggest question, which was why why did uh, City of Edmonton go to a level two that was an administrative directive, and uh, why does our level two um, state that we need a bylaw? And you answered that very well, so I appreciate that. Um, I guess. Uh, I guess we, as, as a city, I would be more focused on just trying to ensure that our staff and the patrons that come into our facilities are well protected with all of the same rules. Um, so would you see this bylaw as uh, when people come into service place or they come up to the counter or whatever, um, still as a, an opportunity to educate or um, would we need to attach a fine to this bylaw in order to, to enforce it? Uh, or do we just um, refuse service? Uh, so I guess maybe if you could comment on, and, and actually the ability um, to have the correct resources in place with our bylaw officers, uh, is that, maybe that's for Mr. Scovel, do we have the ability to enforce a bylaw in terms of the resources that we have on our bylaw team. Oh, yeah, I, um, I might let Percy or Carrie supplement this, but my understanding it just because I'm actually on vacation, so I'm staying fully on top But my understanding is that yes, we could have a little, little bit of a resource challenge with our, our municipal <laughs> enforcement officers. We, we have 11, as I recall correctly. So um, again, with as with any new bylaw, uh, in the absence of, of additional resources, that means we, we get spread a little thinner each time. And I guess if there is a significant initial surge in uh, in uh, complaints, uh, you know, we could uh, could have to put some other calls uh, at a lower priority for a time period till that surge is over. I noticed that Aaron is on the line. Aaron, do you have any comments on that? Uh, just I agree with uh, with Kevin on his uh, on his comments. Um, you know, we've got uh, we've got eleven positions for municipal enforcement right now. Um, nine nine frontline officers, one supervisor. So if we did get an increase in call volume, or you know, we'll we'll bend to council's will on priorities. So if if mask enforcement is a priority for council, it just means. Um, a little bit less work in other areas, maybe you know, proactive traffic enforcement or or dog parks or or whatever the other um, um, potential areas that we would have to you know minimize service delivery on for a period of time. Of course, we'll do our best to do what we can with everything we have, but um, there would there would definitely be a little bit of service level reductions in other areas. Okay. Thanks. Uh, if I could just follow up then, so I mean, you said dog park, which actually just spurred a question for me, but you know, we can make a bylaw that's just about indoor public spaces uh, and not outdoor public spaces, correct? I'm guessing, David? 
You want to answer that yeah, one? Yes, correct. I think I think what Aaron was getting at is that he might have to divert do, uh, divert resources from other things such as dark park enforcement. Yeah, I think okay. it's always contemplated. It's been contemplated always on this issue that if you do a bylaw, it would strictly be for indoor spaces. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Hanson, are you leaning towards maybe asking master mandatory in our dog parks or on the trails? Is that what you were thinking? No, no, and I and I I'm um, my position right now is just indoor public spaces where where we have as a city control um, over protecting patrons and our staff. So I'm not actually considering anything beyond that. Okay. Great. Thank thank you. Sure. Watkins. Yeah, my first question was of uh, Mr. Janky. Did, did you say, you said something about a 50 per 100,000 standard. What, what was that in regard to? Through the mayor to you, uh, this would be that, uh, that 50 per 100,000 standard is the standard the province uses in their relaunch map uh, is, uh, is a trigger to uh, bump it up into uh, a watch category. Okay. Our, our, our current level is 2.9 per 100,000 within St. Albert. Okay. And then basically, uh, you were saying that, uh, from what I, my understanding of what you said is that there was no proof that it works, either in preventing the spread or stopping you from catching it. But the perception is that if you wear it, it will stop the spreading of it. Maybe you could just clarify that a bit. I was a little confused on that. Can you say that again? I just <laughs> <laughs> you were saying that that you kind of went on and said that there was really no evidence that it works either way, but that people really thought that when they were wearing them that it would stop you from spreading it if you had it. Is that what you said, basically? Uh, not 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 quite that way. Uh, like the the research is not clear because the the studies have not been kind of uh as as sharp as they as they need need to be to be uh uh repeatable and uh and and scrutinized what uh what the studies kind of indicate are that non-medical masks uh pre prevent uh prevent you spreading disease but they don't they don't uh they don't protect you as as much as uh, as they protect others. So you know it, it, you can you can think of it in terms of uh, a cloth mask or a cloth barrier in front of your face, uh, catching catching you coughing. So if you have a candle in front of yourself and you're you're blowing a candle out, you can do it very freely uh, with without a mask. But if you're blowing a candle out with a mask in front of your face, the, the air particles don't go as, as, as far in putting that candle out. Mm -hmm. and, and we are talking non-medical masks versus medical masks. Correct. So that's Correct. why you're, if somebody coughs, some droplets, depending on who made their mask, and depending on the, the, the tightness of the weave of whatever the cloth, more could get out than with some masks versus other masks, right? But they're all non-medical masks that we're talking about. Correct. Right, okay. And then um, you said that there would be, to get an exception, there would be no proof to be granted an exception. Did you say that? Uh, so it was- Clarify that. I, I, so how do you- <laughs> Basically in the Calgary situation, in the, in the Calgary bylaw, uh, people who, uh, People who have medical conditions or rationale for not wearing a mask uh, don't have to provide that proof for the for the for their exception in, in, uh, in when during enforcement. That's how they're how they're deal, dealing with it. So basically, if somebody says I, I have a condition, I can't wear it. It's going to bother my face or whatever. Uh, the, in Calgary, they'll accept that, and there's no proof. Correct. Okay. Um, maybe Mr. Giesbrecht could comment on how that would be an enforcement issue for him. Like, I'm, I'm concerned about the enforcement of this and the fact that uh, 
Uh, you know, if people are going to be calling all the time and by the time you get there, the guy's either going to put his mask on or not have his mask on. Um, you know, there's just a lot of issues about enforcement here. And with no proof, anybody can just say, well, I've got a condition, right? Yeah, that's correct. I think I think that would be one of the challenges for enforcement um, on, on a particular exemption like that. Um, you know, requiring someone to have a, a medical certificate would, would be a challenge as well to write that into a bylaw. So, you know, from a, from a perspective of uh, response to, to calls, you know, one of the things I would add is, is that um, it's probably not uh, reasonable for officers to, to respond to, to particular incidents, specific incidents. So if someone calls in and says, you know, a particular person's walking down the street without a mask or sorry, in a certain building without a mask, um, or the ability for the officers to, to get to that specific incident is going to be a challenge. Um, but putting in place a proactive program with one or two or three officers that are, are proactively going into businesses and, and um, facilities um, looking for mask violations and educating the public, um, that's, that's a possibility. Um, but, but from a prosecution perspective, if an actual offense gets, gets uh, issued or a ticket gets issued or, or, you know, proof of an exemption, um, yeah, uh, challenging. And, um, it, you were talking about that, uh, if we passed a bylaw like that, uh, you, we would just basically reduce enforcement on other things so we could meet that need. Uh, if we weren't to reduce enforcement of anything else. And you just had to have to enforce this bylaw. What, how many officers do you think it would take? Additional officers. Like if we just kept the service same service level of, of other enforcement to enforce this, what would be your estimate? Well, uh, I'd be scared to to give you a number to tell you the truth. It's it's such a hard thing to do on something like this because it's almost a little bit of a period of time as well, right? You know, similar mm -hmm. to when we were mandated to um, enforce the uh, chief medical officers of health orders. Um, what we did was was handled the call volume that was coming in and and adjusted slightly and then just made that a more of a priority. Didn't mean that we weren't enforcing the other issues. It's just that they were less of a priority and the you know the response times were were less. Um, and then when things slow down, you know you pick up some of the stuff that's been held in the queue. So I think something similar would would happen in a situation like this. We're talking mm -hmm. long term. Um, a proactive long-term enforcement program where we're probably talking one to two officers similar to to the way we handle proactive traffic safety enforcement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay and then um, this may be I don't know who wants to answer this question but maybe we can take a stab at it is uh, we all hear about bylaws that are on the books and they never get taken off the books about spitting on a sidewalk or whatever or, you know you can't wear shorts on a Sunday or something so what is the trigger to stop this and like, so we're going to, so if we pass this bylaw, then when are we going to, when are we going to end it? And what is going to be the trigger to end it? And who's going to decide? I know council is going to ultimately decide that we're going to end it and we rescind the bylaw, but what are we going to use as a metric to say, okay, it's time to stop wearing face coverings because it seems like the uh, government has used 50 per hundred thousand as a standard. And we're sitting at, I thought you told me 2.9 per hundred thousand. So anybody can answer that question. <laughs> I think, I'll jump at once. Yeah. No, yeah, I think maybe we'll uh, get Percy to answer that, his thoughts on it. I mean, I, that was my question exactly, Councillor Watkins. Um, this might be a, a, a decision of council. Right, but we when, passed what, it in, in, yeah. Is it in for six months? Do we anticipate it being in for a year, two years? I know, months? Percy, how often is Calgary reviewing their bylaw? Maybe that would help. <laughs> I don't know exactly how often they're reviewing their bylaw. I think they like the, this is the sort of thing that's going to be a it's it's going to be an ongoing challenge. You have to watch the situation. You have to uh, use the medical officer of health's advice as well as the chief officer of medical uh, chief medical officer of health's advice. And our situation in Saint Albert is kind of a microcosm of the broader community. Uh, so, so while we may have a limited number of transmission or cases within St. Albert, if our surrounding uh, uh, municipalities uh, like Edmonton, where many of our where residents uh, work, travel, uh, and, uh, and go into, has uh, high cases, 
we, you know, we, we may have a different situation that you have to make a decision based on what's going on in that regional context beyond um, our local context. So I think it's, it's, it's something that has to be fluid and has to be uh, based on sound uh, advice and understanding of the situation around. Oh, just finally, so if we use, so you said we're going to use health advice to determine this. So if we use health advice, is that 50 per 100,000? Trigger mandatory? Oh, that's, that's kind of a, a harder one to, yeah. uh, harder one to say, because that, that 50 per 100,000 may be, may be different than, uh, uh, like if we have a specific outbreak in a specific facility, we may have, uh, different, different situations that are, that are, uh, uh, pushing those pieces too, right? And once again, sorry, I, sorry to belabor this, but once again, define what the 50 per 100,000 is again. That's, that's 50 per 100,000 is like uh, the, the province looks at, uh, they, they break it down into different uh, municipalities or, or different districts. The city of St. Albert is one district. So they look at number of cases being greater than or equal to 10 cases within the community plus uh, a, a ratio of uh, greater than or equal to 50,000 per 100, uh, 50 per 100,000 uh, in, in cases of COVID. So right now we have two cases within our active cases within our community, and we're at this ratio of 2.9 per per 100,000 because of our, our population. Okay, okay, thank you. Those are my questions, thanks. All right, Councillor Hughes. Thank you. Those are really good questions, Councillor Watkins. So he took a bunch of mine and I appreciate that. Um, a couple of the questions I have. So one of my concerns is that you're telling me that for enforcement, um, even if we were to increase the number of staff so that we could maintain other, um, Ever all the same levels of service on that on that category, would, would there be a delay in hiring? How long would it take to hire the additional staff, assuming it was approved by council? Um, I'll take that one on. So bringing on uh, a community peace officer who is, is probably a, a three to four month process um, because of RCMP security clearances as well as the authority that we need from the solicitor general to give them the peace officer authority um hiring okay. a bylaw hiring a bylaw enforcement officer which is a little bit different than a community peace officer um still has uh security clearance processes but uh um, we wouldn't have the solicitor general process so we're probably you know two months something like that so if we were just to say that we're going to decrease other areas and focus on enforcement in this one, we'd be looking at a revenue decrease and I'm assuming because there'd be a lot fewer tickets issued. Uh, it's uh, hard to say uh, exactly what the revenue impact would be, but um, if it was, uh, I'll give you an example, if, if we reassigned our traffic enforcement um, proactive patrol assignments to mask patrols where it's more education than enforcement on tickets, then yes, there would be um, for their revenue. Um, there'd be less revenue being brought in than there would be on traffic enforcement. Thank you. Um, so the other concern I had um, was with the exemptions as well. So what we're hearing is that if someone says they have an exemption, so, but, so one of my concerns is that someone's not wearing a mask and then another person, we start doing community policing and the community person comes and starts basically going after that first person saying that you should be wearing a mask or whatever and then that person says i don't i have an exemption and then it escalates because one person doesn't believe him or doesn't think it's satisfactory versus the other one now they have a justification going back and forth whether bylaws involved or not um and so there's no proof of exemption required um and yet we're going to have a bylaw like i'm 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 trying to look at how this is actually practical and how this will not actually start pitting people against each other those who are emotionally charged towards having it and then going after people who are not wearing it and who have very valid reasons for not wearing it. So I'm not sure 
how that would play out. I'm just um, with this exemption issue. It looks to me like this is this is more like a signatory type of bylaw versus actually an enforceable bylaw. Is that a question, Councillor Hughes? Yeah, I'm wondering. I mean, it does not look like it's actually a bylaw versus it's just a bylaw on paper because anyone could claim they have an exemption. Um, I guess, you know, what I would add to that is um, you're, you're not wrong in that, um, you know, if we don't write in certain proof of, of exemptions or certificates, it, it will then become a, a little bit of a discretionary matter for, for each of the officers that are on the road. So, you know, there is a there is a potential that if an officer, you know, came across a situation where a person, um, you know, just said that they, there's a reason why they're not having to, to wear a mask and um, the officer didn't believe it, um, you know, there is a potential that he could still, he or she could still issue that ticket. Uh, and then the matter would be brought up in court um, months down the road on the prosecution side of the matter as to, you know, is it a reversal in a situation where they have to prove um, that that they were exempt or you know how does the how do the courts deem that um, that kind of prosecution it's, it's the two levels of it you know it doesn't doesn't mean the officer wouldn't have the ability to issue the ticket at the time later on prosecution is is really the challenge of what we're talking about there okay i uh, i also just have concerns about putting something forward where the research is questionable about whether or not it's even effective um, and then asking people to do this. How many cases have we had in St. Albert where they've been sourced to um, coming from a city facility where the transmissions occurred in a city facility out of our 39 or whatever we have? I don't even know if we have that information. We wouldn't have that information. Health does not. Uh, the, the only time health will advise us of a direct uh, uh, case within our facility is if, uh, if we actually have somebody who, who, uh, who is, who is uh, potentially transmitting to others within the facility. Okay, and we don't have anything that indicates that occurred. No, the only the only uh, situation where there uh, that we're aware of where there was somebody with uh, uh, who was COVID positive was in the pickleball courts. And how many of those were and that was outside? And how many of those new after that? I don't believe there's any new cases occurred. However, we would not be apprised on on any uh, any additional cases triggered to that that the well, that's. When, 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 when was our last case that was a new case? It was over two weeks ago, right? Three weeks ago? That's correct. I'm a St. Albert sure. resident. Yeah. Okay. And I do believe that the pickleball was around that time as well. So if there had been a new case, it would have shown up in the past few days or week, I would assume. Depends if they were a resident of St. Albert or a resident of another community because they only report based on your home community. Okay, well, nothing from St. Albert has occurred from residents in Albert from the physical ball. Is that correct? It's hard, hard for us to tell. We can't, we can't, uh, we can't uh, say one way or the other because health doesn't share that information due to FOIP. Okay, and, uh, but I'm just looking at the fact that the pickleball um, case happened more than three weeks ago. So, and we haven't had any new cases confirmed in the past three weeks, which means that outside with the pickleball court did not give us a confirmed case within the city of St. Albert. I mean, that's just regardless of what the city, is. we haven't had any case to come forward, so we don't have to worry about it coming from them. Um, the other question I had was the survey data. I'm having such a difficult time with this survey data that says that 74% of people would like mandatory masks while 34% of people wear them. I mean, that's basically saying that like 40% of people don't wear them and yet would like to be mandated to wear them. So they voluntarily don't wear them, but would like to have to force to be wearing them. I just, I'm having a hard time with that survey number when it, it's, especially considering that a lot of people, I mean, it's been proven that people tend to respond the way their, the, the surveyor would like indicate that they would go to. It's almost like um, meeting the request of the surveyor. So I'm just trying to figure out how 40% of people 
don't wear them but would like to be forced to wear them. I, has there been anything at all challenged about those numbers? Well, that, that isn't our survey, uh, so that's, an, uh, that's uh, a survey from another municipality. So we're taking the data as, as is in those surveys. Okay. And if this was included in all indoor public facilities, would, during our council meetings, would we all, we all be wearing masks? I th maybe Mr. Scoble can answer that one, but I think uh, the Calgary bylaw says once you get to your place of work, as long as you're six feet away, then you would not need to wear your mask. And we are having barriers put up, so you could probably take your mask off, Mr. Scoble. Well, yeah, I guess I just add, we'd have to take a further look at that. I mean, I, you know, again, let's maybe see what the, the Edmonton proposed bylaw comes out as. Um, you know, I think without speaking to a specific council meeting, I, I think in terms of office space, if there was no engineering control separating people, you would be required to wear masks. So I guess it's it's a matter of what sort of engineering controls we put into the council chambers and if they're they're deemed to be sufficient at that time. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to find five different pages at once here, so just please be patient with me for one more second. Yeah, no problem. Um, I may have covered it. Just, okay, hold on. I'm looking at one other screen because when, this is the most cumbersome meeting I've ever had to attend, I'll tell you at this moment. Um, just logistically for me. Okay, the other thing I was trying to just come to figure out is that we're saying that in government facilities, like I'm looking at service place. So we're saying that people should wear masks if it was mandated across all public places people would wear masks in the hallway where they're not breathing heavily and can easily, for example, service place stay well more than six feet apart. Those highways are quite wide. But then when they get to the gym where they are breathing heavily, they're going to take their mask off. So I'm trying to figure out why we would, what the basis, what was Calgary thinking? Do you have any idea what they said when they're like, you should be wearing a mask in the hallway, which is a low traffic area but when you're breathing heavily and more likely to push your droplets anywhere, that the mask comes off. Because I mean, obviously you'd have to have the mask off when you're exercising, but the other spot is a lower risk and yet they're recommending masks. Did they give any logic behind that? Go ahead, Percy. <laughs> so with this one, it's following the provincial guideline documents and uh, Basically, the, the guidance documents are health-based uh, health information guidance, uh, which indicates that in the case of uh, uh, heavy physical activity, heavy exertion like that, uh, that um, masks are, are not indicated. Whereas in the, in the common spaces, you're, you're, uh, uh, you're you're not doing that heavy exertion and that sort of thing. You're it's 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 uh, it's indicated in that area, and there's there's spatial recommendations that are also in place. Uh, increased spatial recommendation and and uh, and uh, number of users yeah, that are that are affiliated with those uh, with those higher higher activity areas than in the in the common spaces where you may be within two meters of other individuals and uh, not be able to provide that separation. So that's why masks are in place in those other areas. Yeah, okay. I, I, I don't see how you would be at a higher risk in that hallway when you can easily maintain six feet apart. Um, so one more thing, I'm going to go back again, Councillor Watkins, thank you for bringing that up because I went quickly with the 50 per 100,000. So the 50 per 100,000 is the standard for where you'd go into a watch category, you said, which would basically mean what you'd think about implementing type of measures. Is that correct? The, uh, the watch is where the, the province would get involved in implementing some of those, some of those uh, or consideration of some of those effects. But once again, like I said, it's understanding what's around your community and, and uh, some of those other, other components as well. 
Right. And so Edmonton's at 19 per 100,000 overall right now. Is that that's what I read? Nineteen per hundred thousand overall in Edmonton. Something something like that. I believe the Duggan area is at one hundred thirteen point eight or something like that per hundred thousand. No, I think you said forty six for Duggan. I wrote it down. So, and even without the masks mandated right now, and Edmonton not having masks mandated right now, St. Albert still maintaining two point nine, and probably decreasing because we've had no new cases and we're waiting for two to wrap up. Um. Right. Like, so really, we haven't the, the fact that Edmonton, like you said, a, a regional approach, but regionally, we haven't had masks mandated. And St. Albert has up to this point not had any issues. I mean, it's been a very, very low numbers. So, I mean, I'm just I'm just the regional approach. I'm trying to figure out why we would care what goes on beyond our boundaries when it's obviously we're able to effectively manage it within our boundaries. Um, okay. Oh, and the other thing is um, the legal challenges, Dr. Uh, Mr. Lafleur. There is a legal challenge going on between for the government of Canada and for the government of Ontario right now, based on masks and other mandates that the, the provinces have put forward. So, uh, by Dr. Uh, Mr. Rocco Galati. So that is uh, that is occurring, and there will be precedent when that comes forward. And uh, I do believe it's also deemed unconstitutional by the city, or not the the country of Austria, their COVID measures have been considered unconstitutional as well. Um, and a couple other countries as well. As the other thing I had was um, when we've been looking at province, countries that have been doing mandatory mask covering, so we looked at, has there been any look at what has been occurring with the countries that do do mandatory mask coverings and their rate of infection? For example, I'm looking at Japan. They've had mandatory mask coverings for uh, forever. Um, and yet their numbers have increased in the past few weeks to as high as they were at the beginning of March and the beginning of April. So has there been any look at um, the effectiveness of that when we look at countries that have actually been doing this from the beginning and yet are still seeing the spikes increasing just like everyone else? Well, I guess I'll jump in, seems nobody else. <laughs> I, I would say no. I mean, inf you know, the administration has presented information that's available from the WHO and, and uh, the province and that sort of thing. So we haven't done an exhaustive evaluation of other countries or, or other mandates elsewhere. Okay. I think that that's something that before a bylaw is put forward, we should be looking at whether or not they're even affected by countries that have put that bylaw forward. And I, and I appreciate the fact, Mr. Scoble, that your staff has done this on very short notice. So. Um, yeah, I'm sure you guys were just working your tails off trying to get this done for this meeting. So I understand that not everything could be done, but I just do think that that's a, a consideration that we should be looking at is the countries that do are having done it, doing it and have done it consistently, if they're even seeing a difference in their numbers compared to everyone else. I think that's all the questions I have, Councillor Heron. Thank you very much. Oh, Great. sorry, Mayor Heron. Thank Mayor you. Heron, sorry. Uh, I just looked up um, Duggan and their rate is... Right, I just missed 113.8. Just that's on the Alberta website. And Northgate, which is close to us, is actually at 35. So just for clarity. And those are the two highest that I can see in Edmonton. Um, any more questions? I saw Councillor Jolly's hand go up, but I don't know if it was to answer a question or did you have more? Yeah, I was just commenting that I, I don't, I did quite a bit of research on the weekend and Calgary's bylaw, I don't think they've set a particular date, but the name of the bylaw is the temporary yeah, bylaw. Yeah. So and I, I just wanted to comment that. Yeah, I was in meetings with Calgary Council on Thursday and Friday, and I think they said they were going to review it every 60 days, just so it's not just sitting there. They, they had time, timelines. Uh, Councillor Hansen. Uh, thanks, Mayor. I uh, do have a process question. So this question I'm going to guess is for uh, Mr. LaFleur. Um, when we go to the alternative motions on page seven of our package, the first one there um, speaks to uh, communication to the public through media, social media around um, wearing face coverings on city facilities. Um, but isn't that level two and shouldn't that say 
that administration be instructed to create a bylaw? Or is that open for um, argument or amendment? Okay, so uh, all of the proposed alternative motions uh, are open for you know tweaking or amendment or revision. But the broadly speaking, the first one was intended to cover the situation where council is not comfortable with a bylaw, but would like to take some action, uh, you know, more in terms of encouraging more so than we've done already, uh, the public to do a certain thing, in this case, to wear, wear face coverings. The other two speak to very much bylaw requirements. So that's really the, the if you, first, the first alternative, would be one for you to consider if for whatever reason you don't like the idea of passing a bylaw. But but you have said prior to that to this that we could be on shaky ground without a bylaw. Uh, that, that's correct. I mean, you you do, you know, without a bylaw, your enforcement mechanisms are hard for me to see where they really are, practically speaking. So if we just want to get people wearing masks on buses. Uh, a bylaw really truly is necessary. I, I, I would from a legal pr perspective. If you really want if you feel strongly that everyone who rides a, a bus should be wearing a mask, then I would definitely recommend a bylaw to that effect. Thank you. All right, Councillor Watkins. This is a question of uh, Mr. Lafleur, probably. Uh, so, so if we have a bylaw and uh, somebody fights it, what does it cost us to, to litigate one uh, complaint on a bylaw like this? Uh, average cost, like if somebody challenges these bylaws, municipal bylaws. Well, a bylaw like this, I would certainly prosecute it myself, and I would simply be prepared to meet any legal challenge if it required, you know, asking the judge for an adjournment to prepare a legal argument. That's what I would do. It could it could be time consuming. There's no question, right? Depending on the level of challenge, if someone actually wanted to raise a char a, a challenge under Section Seven of the Charter of Rights alleging that a bylaw like this is a depriving of liberty, uh, then uh, there's a huge amount of case law that would have to be reviewed, a huge number of precedents that would have to be looked at. Okay, okay thank you. That was my, my question, sorry. All right. Uh, I just have, most of my questions have been answered, but I just have one and it's probably for uh, the virtual EOC team. Uh, my feedback over the weekend was that businesses are hesitant to require masks in their in their premises because they can't enforce it and they don't want their young staff to enforce it. So they were looking to the city to do this. Have, have we had any calls from businesses about um, their concerns about keeping their patients safe and, and asking for this? Mayor Heron, um, I had a conversation with the CEO of the Chamber who indicated that um, her conversation with businesses indicated support for this. Um, the only, I guess, cautionary, and this was um, a comment actually we received from our leaseholders out of Service Place and Drew McGinley Arena. Um, the comment was with restaurants, as long as once you were seated and your table was, you know, two meters from another table, as long as you can remove your mask at that point, because otherwise it might discourage people from eating in restaurants. Right. Um, but as long as the enforcement expectation, so similar to Calgary, if the enforcement expectation isn't on um, the young workers at an establishment, then there seemed to be general support. It is on the Chamber's agenda, however, on uh, Wednesday at their meeting to have a fulsome discussion. Okay. And then this is for Mr. Scoble. So if Edmonton is uh, going to mandatory masks on transit August 1st. Um, could we take recommendation number one and allow you to to do that and then follow it up after the fact um, with the bylaw just to give Mr. Um, Lafleur time to draft it? So do one and two, uh, one in the short term, one two in the longer term. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we we can do the same as Edmonton's done in the absence of a bylaw. It's just uh, you know, again. Enforcement will be difficult. Um, you know, may I guess could create some 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 potential conflict situations where you know again I, I saw an article I don't know CTV or something how that nicely asked somebody to uh, take measures. <laughs> uh, I mean, 
all we can do is ask, but we can't, we can't refuse anything under that. So without that bylaw, but we can certainly do that. And then the second one there is, you know, again, a bylaw can come back at any time determined by council, whether it's this week or next week or four weeks from now or whatever, we've left that open when, when council wants to consider a bylaw. August 1st is Saturday, I believe. So if we wanted a bylaw in place, we'd have to do it Thursday or Friday. That's correct. Okay. I saw Councillor Broadhead's hand go up and then Councillor Watkins. Uh, just uh, how do we manage the, the social pressure? If we were to Im impl impose a bylaw or even if we don't impose a bylaw, but recommend I mean, I've already been told, where's my mask as I walk into a place? Uh, you start to put this out there and now, what, what, what's the general uh, experience in other communities where they've done this? Has it been a uh, disaster or has it actually been smooth in terms of the implementation of a mask bylaw? I don't know if we really have comparisons. Calgary doesn't even take effect till August 4th. Um, I don't know, does anyone, has anyone heard from some of the provincial mandates out east? No? We're, we're aware a little bit about uh, somebody getting uh, arrested in, uh, I believe it was Quebec, uh, uh, for it. But uh, and on Ontario, Quebec have had more experience, obviously, than, uh, than we have on this. Uh, and the experience in Alberta is, it's, it's too soon to say anything because obviously nothing's in effect yet, right? Did that help you, Councillor Broadhead? <laughs> uh, you know, it's just interesting that uh, in Councillor Hughes, and I think we're all aware of it, that there's already a social pressure to, to provide as safe a community as possible. And the irrespective of the science or any kind of rational debate around whether it's useful or not, there's this sense that the use of, of, of masks contributes to health and safety in our community. And that's, uh, to me, that's the big argument here mm -hmm. is that uh, your entire community or a, a large portion of the community wants this to happen. Yeah. And we, we can say, no, it's not gonna work, it's not gonna work, or it's not necessary, or it's against the law. And yet they still want it. And, and the fear and the anxiety out there is real. Yeah. That you can't deny. Uh, Councillor Watkins and then Councillor Jolly. Uh, yeah, I just, just, just listening to all this, it just, if we have it on transit, are we, we're turning the bus driver into Because, like, if somebody, again, somebody, I said, if we ban, if we say you must have masks on transit, then we're going to turn the bus driver into the enforcement officer. In a lot of ways, because somebody will come on to get on the bus without a mask. So then the bus driver will be forced to say, You can't, is the bus driver going to say, uh, deny entrance onto the bus? Or will we have masks to hand people if they get on the bus and they don't have one? Or if somebody's running late to the bus and uh, they forget their mask at home and they get to the bus, like, are we kicking them off the bus? Will we be handing them a mask? I do know we're providing masks through transit, but Mr. Scoble, do you want to add to that? And, and, do we, and does transit have a concern about enforcement and will transit be denying people access to transit if they don't have a mask? Because it'll be the bus driver who's going to be the frontline guy right there. So, so I'll perhaps defer to the EOC on the status of masks. I know we've received a, a number from the, the province of Alberta for, for transit. And again, I guess, you know, in terms of the bus drivers enforcing, um, well, in the absence of a bylaw, they can't. I don't believe they can refuse service if somebody does not want to wear a mask. I guess I would turn it over to David and or Aaron about how this would be tackled if, if there is a bylaw in place and somebody's refusing to wear a mask uh, about how that would be administered. So I can, I'll chime in on this uh, just a little bit. So we are still distributing the provincial masks. We have ample supply. Uh, we've been giving them out at the transit stations right now in blitzes and have actually run out of people to give them to. So we have 
uh, far more uh, supply than the demand has indicated to this point. So our drivers, while uh, they are encouraging, as is transit as a whole, encouraging uh, riders right now to wear masks, there is no enforcement. They are not refusing service to passengers who do not wish to comply. Thank you. Councillor Jolly. I, I just wanted to respond to Councillor Broadhead's kind of question about if, if anyone knew about how kind of enforcement was looking. Um, I know locally some businesses are requiring it. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know if you read the Gazette article, but one of the, there was a mom who has a, a daughter with special needs. Who's, she's not able to wear a mask. Um, they had an absolutely horrific experience um, at TELUS World of Science. Um, and and I, I know her, I've had discussions about this experience and um, that, that kind of stigma, kind of that stigma attached to not wearing a mask is definitely out there. Everyone in my family wears a mask everywhere, so we haven't run into that, but um, talking with people who can't, it's, uh, it's people are being mean. <laughs> so yeah. the, I just wanted to, to point that out. Okay. Answer to Councillor Broadhead's question, I guess. Yeah, this is hard. Um, Councillor Hughes, I'll go back to you. Do you have anything, any more questions? Uh, no, I think everything's really been well covered. So, um, yeah, that's, thank you for asking, though. So. Yep, yeah, sure. Great. Um, Council, I think we're out of questions. Does anyone want to discuss the alternative motions? Uh, one or two, if we just want to talk about transit and public facilities. Councillor Hansen, go ahead. Thanks, um, Madam Mayor. Yeah, I am, am ha certainly happy to move receiving this as information as the it, it recommendations states on page one, but I also would like to further um, move the alternative uh, number one, but, but I would say rather than be instructed to communicate to public that administration be instructed to create a bylaw and then communicate to public. So that's what I would like to do. Okay, well, number two is the bylaw. Did you see the difference? I guess you could incorporate the bylaw into number one somehow because you want the um, social media. I guess so, it's, it's more succinct, I guess, number two. Um, I guess I, I just, I like the communication part of it. I just, uh, uh, and the signage and all that. So it's a little bit more, um, okay, number two is fine. I would move number two then. Mr. Scoble, if uh, if number two gets moved right now, is would the public engagement, the education, the social media, et cetera, be part of that? Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, uh, just for clarification, I mean, really, number one and number two are just following what Edmonton's done to date, but you could certainly skip number one and go right to number two, but incorporate the communication and all the stuff that's in number one into number two. Yeah, kind of like going from level two to level three in terms of Edmonton. So this would be their level three. Honestly, Councillor Hansen, you could move one and two. Yeah. Um, that's not redundant. No, They're not mutually exclusive, no. No. Okay, well then um, that would be what I would like to debate today. Okay, and so that is just for transit, not for um, city-owned facilities, is that correct? Um, well, well no, St. Albert Place and St. Albert Transit. Yeah. Okay, sorry, yeah. Um, and you see that's the thing in number one, it says in other civic facilities. <laughs> so sorry, we had an ironing board go up. Um, so yeah, so I guess they're not mutually exclusive because I am looking um, for some rules around indoor facilities that is run are run by the city and including transit. Okay, so Mr. Lafleur, um, it sounds like Councillor Hanson wants the bylaw to not to be transit, St. Albert Place, as well as, as other civic facilities. Service Place, Park, all the city facilities, Councillor Hansen? Mm -hmm. Because I think that's in our bailiwick. Yep, okay. So Mr. LaFleur, what suggested wording should we put in there to add those other facilities in the bylaw? Just 
say, and other civic facilities? Or all? Actually, maybe this is Mr. School. I, I was muted there. My apologies. Yeah, I would say that all you'd have to do you, in, the, in the second line, say effective August 1st, all persons in any civic facility, just take out St. Albert Place and put in any, any municipal facility. And, and then later on where it says, and other civic facilities at council's discretion to be specified by council, you know, strike all of that out. I'm sure the uh, I'm sure our ledge officers are listening to this and they'll get that into the chat quickly. Okay, and in number two, when it comes to the bylaw uh, requirement of mandatory masking in in all city all, all municipal facilities instead of St. Albert Place. Okay, and everything else is the, fine, the same. Right, Councilor Hudson, I want to make sure that that's what you want. Uh, it is what I want, and and um, what I am not seeing here um, specifically is exemptions. But I am assuming that we are talking about exemptions for um, all of the things that we talked about earlier: persons with um, developmental disabilities, people who who find it problematic to wear a mask. Um, they are all, from my perspective, would be exempt. Um, so I don't know how we want to include that in this I, recommendation. I don't think you need to. Uh, okay. if, you're to if you're going to expand it to all city facilities, other considerations come in, like for example, exercise rooms. Uh, are you gonna require masks while people are exercising or not? We would have to have a lot of internal discussion. We would have to craft the bylaw. And then ultimately when you see the bylaw, then you can, you can make amendments at second reading, right? So. If you give us general instruction like that, we'll do the best we can. And uh, and ultimately it's council's decision what it, what exceptions you want to put in. Okay. But you're gonna draft it uh, with a mirror of Edmonton's bylaw, correct? That's correct, yes. Which has all those exemptions, Councillor Hansen. Perfect. And it has exemptions for restaurants because I do recognize that the restaurants are worried about that. Yeah, and it's tricky for restaurants, but I think um, ultimately um, it's eating and drinking. You can't have a mask on, doing other activities in a restaurant, like walking to your table, probably should have a mask on. Okay. I think in the chat, Councillor Hansen, is the motions the way you would like them? Why don't you read them into the record? You're muted. Yep. <laughs> so there's a there's a problem with it. Uh, nope. on the first one, uh, the they put in the correct one. Any civic facilities but at the bottom, they should have eliminated and other civic facilities because that's now redundant. So right. if you're listening, uh, staff, uh, after the uh, in about the fifth or sixth line down in the first recommendation, take out the words and other civic facilities at council's direction. To be specified by council because that's already been taken care of uh, earlier on. I'll try and skip that when I read it. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, that administration be instructed to communicate to the public through media, social media, the city website, and by signage that effective August 1st, 2020, all persons in any civic facilities, accepting only city employees when alone in private offices when the door is closed and all persons in a St. Albert transit bus or other transit facility must at all times be wearing a mask or other face covering that covers the mouth, nose, and chin, ensuring a barrier that limits the transmission of infectious respiratory droplets, and that this requirement remain in place until such time as Alberta's Chief Medical Officer of Health issues official public advice that face masks are no longer recommended as a measure for limiting the risk of spread of infectious disease. And number two, that administration prepare for council's consideration on a date determined by council, uh, which I'm happy to implement here if you want, a bylaw to formalize the requirement of mandatory masking in St. Albert in all civic facilities. All civic facilities, including fines enforceable through the courts for non-compliance. Okay, before I, um... Except that, did, did you put a date in there? I'd leave that up to uh, David and his team, like what, what's reasonable? 
So I guess maybe I'll start that off where, you know, we can, whatever is reasonable for council. I mean, as I've seen, it's a one page bylaw from Edmonton, their draft bylaw. It's, it's you okay. know, relatively simple. So it's really, when does council want to consider the bylaw more than anything? But Edmonton's bylaw is for all indoor spaces, not just um, civically owned spaces. Correct. Okay, so it, or it might even be simpler. Um, I think we should probably have this in place August 1st so that we can align the transit with Edmonton's transit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that would make it have the bylaw come to us on Friday. The 31st? That's doable. That is doable. Okay. Okay. So much for my uh, week off. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's uh, put that date in there. And the other question I have, and this is actually probably for Percy, um, because we don't have any Alberta Health here. The first part says it's, it remains in place until the CMOH um, no longer recommends masks as a limit of risk of spreading infectious disease. Well, as long as there's infectious disease, whether it's COVID or the flu or anything out there in this world, masks are always going to be recommended to limit the spread. So that doesn't give me very high confidence that this bylaw will ever have an end date. So we could call it temporary. We should call as it- As they did in Calgary. And I think we should maybe just put a review period in instead of, um, you know what I'm saying, Councillor Hansen? Sorry, say that again. Instead of relying on the uh, provincial government to, to say that masks are no longer recommended, um, why don't we put a review date in? Sure, that's better. Uh, Mr. LaFleur. Um, you put it at the end of the year by December 31st or something. Dinner. Let's review it in, in two months. Okay. Yeah. Could I make a could I make a suggestion too, if it's all right, Mayor? That maybe you know that we, if you're going to consider a bylaw, perhaps it's on Thursday, so such that if Council does pass a bylaw, it gives us Friday to get ready instead of passing it on Friday and trying to get it ready on the weekend. That's fine. Yeah, that's the thirtieth. Um, given given the fact that it's summertime, does Council have any problem with moving this really to debate next Monday? It's only a few days then we just wouldn't be aligned with Edmonton then? For no, we wouldn't be, but it, this could be logistically difficult with everybody's schedules being summertime, uh, staff being off. Um, and I just, I don't see a big problem with that. Oh, Monday is a stat holiday, Tamara's saying. <laughs> um, it's your motion, Councillor Hanson. I'm fine with uh, either July 30th or August 4th, which is the Tuesday. Yeah, you know, I I just assume move it to August fourth, Kevin, if that's okay with you. Um, yeah, entirely. We're here entirely at uh, whatever. Yeah, are for I, I think it's just uh, August fourth. I think I think that we can manage that uh, non-alignment, non-compliance for a few days. Okay, I'm fine with that. Uh, let's get August fourth in there, and then at the. Uh, we just need to have something, a review pe period somewhere in there, Mr. LaFleur. Yeah, uh, again, whatever council instructs. We it's can... probably the bylaw that needs to get reviewed, not motion number one, so. C correct. Yeah. yeah. So why don't we just um, add a sentence at the end that says, and the bylaw will come back October 30th or 60 days later, whatever it works out. Okay. You, sure. you, you choose your wording, Councillor Hanson. Yeah, uh, 60 days is good. Okay. All right. Okay, I'm gonna accept that motion and I'm gonna let, oh, Councillor Jolly, go ahead. Do you have an, a question for Councillor Hanson? Okay. Um, I just wanted to, to clarify. So the intent is only indoor spaces, not outdoor events where physical distancing isn't possible. I've just had a lot of questions about the farmer's market. So I just want to confirm you're not contemplating the farmer's market where we're elbow to elbow. Uh, no, except the CEO has told me that they are encouraging masks 
uh, at the at the farmers market. But no, I, this is specific okay. to indoor, and I will let um, the chamber deal with that since it's their gig. Okay, thank you. Okay, and I got a text from Councillor Hughes. Go ahead, Councillor Hughes. Hi, thank you. Um, so with this um, bylaw, are we basically also saying that all the staff that are in their working spaces and cubicles would also have to be wearing masks the entire day? Because most people don't have their offices with doors. Uh, Mr. Scoble, do you wanna add something in there that if their cubicle is six feet apart, they can take their mask off or how do you wanna? To... Well. I don't, I'm going to defer to David. I don't know that that's necessary in the bylaw. I believe, you know, that's a, I think that's in the realm of an administrative direction without uh, necessarily having a bylaw, but I'll, I'll defer to David whether it needs to be in the bylaw or not. Well, the, the, the bylaw certainly would be directed to members of the public for sure. Uh, the, we're going to have to have some internal discussion, you know, in, in recommendation number one, we had mentioned if you're in a, office where you can close the door then it's okay to take the mask off if you want to expand that you may run into some people saying well you know you guys get to not wear a mask why are you forcing us but we're gonna to have to think very carefully about what exceptions should apply to an employee okay okay that's it thank you thank you she's muted again Councillor Watkins yeah, this is, I'm sorry, I'm not too familiar with what's happening with the market now. So the market is operating at Service Place still. Is that correct? Yeah. So is that a city-owned facility and because we own Service Place and they're on our property? So that's a question. Like, so we were talking, like, you know, Natalie said they're, 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 they're shoulder to shoulder in there, but they are on our property now. And if we pass this bylaw, they're operating on a city-owned facility. So mm -hmm. they, they come on. It's, out, it's outdoor though, Councillor Watkins. We're only talking indoor. Okay, 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 there you go. Thank you. And that will need to be clear when the bylaw comes back. Yeah. Okay, uh, any more questions before I accept the motion? Okay, I'm accepting it. Go ahead, Councillor Hansen. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I, um, I know this is a difficult uh, discussion and for lots of reasons. Um, I think some of the facts that we know are there. It, there is going to be a second wave. In fact, if you look at the Canadian uh, website on coronavirus, it's completely spiked. Uh, I was just looking at it last night. Um, I think we would be naive to think that we're managing it really well, and but we're out of the woods because we're managing it so well here in St. Albert. St. Albert, St. Albertans are doing a great job. Most are very comfortable wearing masks. Uh, most like the fact that others are wearing masks. Um, from my perspective, this is about community safety. This is about uh, lessening transmission of this disease. We've got airplanes going, flying from province to province now. We've got people moving in and out of all of our cities. Uh, I think it's important for us to be regional with Edmonton for all kinds of reasons. I think uh, if we didn't pass a, a mandatory mask bylaw, we're saying we're, we're immune to this disease. And we are absolutely not immune to it. And it's only going to get worse. Kids are going to be going back to school. Um, there is going to be transmission. There's just no question about that. Uh, and, it's, and in most cases, experts are saying it's going to be a lot worse than the first uh, wave. So I think for those who want to refuse wearing masks and you know they're talking about their their individual human rights uh, you know i accept that but we're a community and this isn't about me it's about we and it's about looking after each other and i don't think it's unreasonable for us as a city to ask people patrons and staff to wear masks and protect each other uh, when you get home, you can take your mask up. When you're in places that aren't city facilities, have at her. But I think uh, as leaders, we need to be strong about ensuring that the people that we serve directly in our facilities, at the very minimum, uh, that we ask them to wear masks to reduce uh, 
the droplets of any infectious disease. We, we can actually slow this down if we do all the right things. And I think this is a small uh, price to pay and, and ask our residents to do in order to keep each other uh, as safe as possible. And so that's it. Anyone else? Go ahead, Councilor Broadhead. All right, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you for those opening comments, uh, Councillor Hansen. Uh, COVID-19, certainly unprecedented uh, in my lifetime, and I suspect in most people's lifetime. Uh, I don't think there's too many that have uh, survived the Spanish flu that are still with us, but nonetheless, here we are and we're facing this uh, global uh, health crisis and Canada is not immune to it, even though we've done better than some. The thing that speaks to me here is around the number of people that have spoken to me around their general sense of anxiety and the possibility of exposure, the possibility of getting sick to, uh, to something that may in fact be life threatening. And uh, so this, it's not like catching the flu even though the flu probably takes out more people than COVID-19. But it's the idea that there is this uh, special uh, sickness that's going around the world and we need to do something around it to reduce the anxiety that our own people are feeling. And from my perspective, if nothing else, the wearing of masks and the provision of a sense of, of um, community working together to address the, the impact of this COVID-19 on St. Albert is worth the bylaw. No matter what we do, we'll be facing legal challenges. That's the nature of being a politician and a governor. You make decisions and then people will challenge that in court if they so desire. So I don't think that in itself is something that we should be fearful of. If it happens, it happens. And if we get told it's unconstitutional and everybody can go without, then fair enough. But until that has come down from the Supreme Court of Canada, I say we take a stand and we say to our people, we are gonna do what is necessary to make our community as safe as possible, recognizing that everybody has to live in this community. And we will do what is best for even those who are, uh, more susceptible to COVID-19 than others. Those people are worthy of me wearing a mask, even if I don't think I'll get it or if I need it. Those people are worthy of me wearing a mask. And so that's why I'm gonna support this motion. Uh, Councillor Hughes, do you have any comments? Yes, thank you. Uh, just give me a second here. Uh, here's the problem with this entire mandatory mask is that there's as many studies that show that they do nothing or in some cases are actually harmful as those that said it might work and have a marginal difference in the outcome. In Norway, they had, they said that if the infection rate is low, the difference is almost non-existent that you'd have to have if the infection rate is low, 200,000 people wearing masks to decrease the number of infections by one person. So with our infection rate currently at two active cases uh, and no new cases, it's not spreading like wildfire. We haven't had new cases in weeks. Our infection rate is ridiculously low to be able to say that this is mandatory and necessary. What we are looking at right now is just simply a discussion about whether or not government should be taking overreach to impose on people's personal freedoms because some people have anxiety about the situation. And if you were to say that it's mandatory for this, why isn't it mandatory for the flu every single year or any other virus that comes forward or that has ever happened? So the problem we have right now is that government should not be taking away personal freedom unless there is a clear and justifiable reason. 
where it's backed up by science that shows that this is the only alternative to move forward, that it's an effective alternative, and that rights should be taken away. None of that has been shown from science. The, the studies that have shown that masks do work are questionable at best and have been admittedly having um, issues with their methodology. So one of the key things we have to look at when we look at any of this is whether or not we are violating people's privacy, whether or not we are violating their free rights as a society. And we have in the society free rights. And it should only be taken away and we should only be imposing restrictions when it's absolutely necessary. With no even new active cases in weeks, this is not absolutely necessary. I understand people have fears, but we also have to recognize that the risk in St. Albert is low. And until we show that it is something higher than this, where it actually has a a statistic to show that it's valid to be considering this and that this methodology is a valid methodology to deal with the situation. This should not be imposed upon people. You know, this, this council has had a history of actually recognizing individual rights. We allowed op opt-out options for the water meter program. We have not declared a state of emergency even when Edmonton chose to do that twice and then rescinded it once. We have not taken a re reactionary approach to anything else that's happened. And yet here we are looking at a cases of two in 67,000 people and then saying we have to curb it because of, and yet Edmonton doesn't have masks right now and we're still maintaining a rate of two per 67,000 people. The other concern we have with exemptions is that anybody who now wants to have exemptions if they're challenged now has to deal and provide violations around privacy because now they're going to have to be able to show and demonstrate and declare to whoever's questioning them why they need to have that, including divulging personal medical information in some cases, um, which also has its own issues. So the fact that it has not yet been declared a challenge at, in the courts is not an excuse for why we should be simply saying that we've had pressure to do something and thus we're going to do it in spite of the fact that we did not have the data to justify this. And I have seen so many emails that have come forward, and Mayor Heron, you've responded saying we're going to take a science-based approach. There is no science to justify this, and there's no data to justify this. We're not past any thresholds. We're, we're at two and going down. We've went on weeks with no cases. So, and, you know, even the consideration about transit. I understand people have anxiety about transit, and we have been encouraging but not forcing people to do anything. But airlines have forced masks on theirs and you will see that the numbers are not increasing so to think that people are going to put masks on and then suddenly rush to transit would also i think be silly because we're not seeing it with places where they do mandate the masks but it does happen and the final point i'll have is again we look at the organ the countries that have mandated masks such as japan and i emailed all of council the chart that came out yesterday and they have had mandatory masks, and their numbers are increasing just as fast, if not faster, than places that do not have mandatory masks. There have been studies that show that mandatory masks actually increase the likelihood of getting it, in some cases up to 13% higher, because you're putting on a dirty mask half the time, you're taking off a mask, you're not washing it over, and if you do go through a zone where it has, happens to have viruses on it, it's now attached to the screen that you're breathing in repeatedly. There's been studies and studies that show this is not a good idea. And yet this has been touted as an idea because, and as Dr. Fauci says, who's in charge of the U.S., and as he said, it's more of a patriotic and symbolic gesture than an actual effective one. And I do not think that we should be mandatory, making mandatory something that's symbolic as opposed to proven effective. And we should have the numbers to justify this. And we do not have the numbers to justify this a problem in St. Albert that needs to be justified, move forward with mandatory masking anywhere. What we've done to date has been effective. And what we've told people over and over again is if you are complicit with all the rules, we will relax them. And instead, we're saying if you're complicit with all the rules, we're now going to make them harder and we're going to more, put more restrictions. And honestly, regardless if you enforce it in 30, 60 days or whenever it happens to be, if the, if the entire thing is we're going to do it till masks are not effective anymore, we're basically saying it's permanent. You can review it every six days if you want. It will be permanent. And I do not think that people should be walking around society permanently wearing masks. That's it. Thank you. All right. I think I had Councillor Watkins and then Councillor Jolly. Um, if we were reviewing wearing medical masks, which we know stop infection, I would, I would be much more 
I probably say, yeah, sure, this is probably a great idea. We're going to slow down infection. But we're not talking about medical masks here. I think that's one of the key points. And there is kind of a lot of doubt about whether these are going to work or not. You know, I, I have concern about enforcement. Uh, I have concern about uh, the proof that the masks work. Um, you know, but, you know, medicine keeps changing. And even the comments about this virus changed daily. And so, you know, maybe next week they're going to say, yeah, it's, it's proven that masks are going to protect you. You better wear a non-medical mask. And, you know, you hearken back to something like thalidomide, you know, which was a drug that was very harmful and deformed all sorts of people. And it was safe and it was handed out to people. And years later they said, oh, sorry, big mistake. It's caused birth defects. So, I mean, medicine changes all the time. I would rather err on the side of caution here now and uh, maybe ask for it on transit and in our public facilities. Um, the, the argument that um, this is somebody's personal freedom of, you know, freedom, you're taking away somebody's personal rights to wear a mask doesn't really wash with me. Like that's the same argument that was used about why we shouldn't wear seat belts and, uh, you know, why we shouldn't have car seats and that. And, you know, we, we have to wear seat belts, we have to have car seats. And it, but, but like I said, I am a little concerned that the, the, if it, it's not proven that these things work, but I agree with Wes though too, it does help people's anxiety because I haven't been wearing a mask. And I know when I get near some people who have a mask on, they seem a little anxious that I don't have a mask on. So all that being said, you know, we do do a lot of things that are symbolic. We passed a bylaw a while ago that was fairly symbolic. Um, this is kind of sending a symbol that we're trying to keep a healthy community. And uh, so I, I guess I'm willing to support it and see what the bylaw comes up with and what the what the parameters of the bylaw are um, before I would support the bylaw. But I think I will support the preparation of a bylaw at this time and maybe wearing masks on uh, buses and in public uh, transit or public facilities. I also want to make sure though that we have a supply of masks available at the entrances to all these facilities to give to people who don't have them because it is an extra cost to people and there's people at a low end of the uh, the budget here or people who don't have a lot of money who have to go and buy these things so if we're going to require it in all these facilities we better hand them out for free at all the facilities those are my comments thanks Councillor jolly thank you um so my thoughts on this is from what i understand for example in nova scotia they're at zero cases and yet they are implementing a mandatory mask policy kind of in, in advance of the school year um, just to, to double down and to make sure that they stay at zero, um, which, which is what I would like to see here in Alberta. Um, you know, we, we know that, and I agree with Councillor Watkins, this is a symbolic bylaw. Um, we, we are not a bubble in the region. Um, we know that 8% of our residents work in Edmonton um, we travel, um, so making this bylaw about civic facilities, um, it, it is symbolic, um, but that symbolism, you know, it, it has meaning and it has a history in St. Albert. We've made health policy decisions having to do with smoking and cannabis in public, um, about bike, bike helmets, and I think Councillor Watkins was referring to the bylaw about conversion therapy. Those are all symbolic as well, but that doesn't make them... Um, less important. Um, I guess that the last point I would make, and I, th I think this is what really convinced me to support this motion, um, is that we've heard, um, I've heard it more than once, which kind of concerns me a little bit, that because the average age of death from COVID-19 is over the average life expectancy, it somehow has anything to do with, with what kind of policy decisions we make. Um, you know, my, just because my, my grandmother is older than that average life expectancy um, doesn't mean that her health is not worth protecting. And, and frankly, telling me that my grandmother's life um, isn't valuable is, is the worst possible way to convince me to not support this type of a bylaw. Um, so thank you to administration for all the work that you've done over the last few days. I know this was a really rushed 
um, background or, and, and I really appreciate the work that, um, that everyone's done in putting this together and the great presentation. Uh, you got a good team, Kevin. So thank you, that's all I have. All right, I'll finish it off. Um, I'm gonna start with the thank yous. Uh, I called this meeting, um, when did I call it? Friday? <laughs> and, uh, and it was because I was so um, embroiled in it in Calgary because I was in Calgary. I was having conversations with my regional mayor colleagues and with um, all the mid-sized mayors and, you know, Airdrie's uh, debating this today, Oak Tokes is debating it today, Medicine Hat, no, sorry, Lethbridge is doing it today. So, you know, so thank you, um, everyone who I can see right now. And, even, and I feel bad for Councillor Mackay, he really would have liked to have been here. Um, so thank you for taking some time out on such short notice and preparing this on such short notice. It was um, not an easy call on my part, but I thought um, we, our public deserved to have this, that we have this conversation. So they sort of know where we stand. So my notes and my comments were prepared um, kind of with the overall lens of mandatory masks everywhere, because that's, I think, what people are, are, are nervous about. I completely support the motions that are in front of us uh, for transit and, um, and our city facilities. And I, the transit for a couple of reasons, because uh, I do think there, are, there is a segment of our population that are resistant and scared to get back on a bus because uh, the masks aren't being worn and I wanna encourage them to come back. That's just good customer service. Um, and it is difficult sometimes to take that six feet um, distance on a bus. So that's why, and of course the regional aspect with Edmonton doing it, it would be confusing if you were jumping on a St. Albert bus and transferring onto an Edmonton. And, and so let's just um, have some unity in the region. I've talked to Rod Frank in Strathcona and I think they will most likely at least follow us to this point, to the transit point. So we will have the regional transit providers all doing the same thing. Um, Councilor Broadhead, this would have been a lot easier with the Transit Commission in place. <laughs> um, and then, of course, the city facilities. I'm glad, Councilor Hansen, that you expanded to them to all of them. I think uh, more than just a, you know, a, what's the what was the word we were using? A signatory, or you know, what was the word we were just using? I can't remember. <laughs> um, this is a kind of a leading by example. If we're going to be really encouraging and recommending masks everywhere in, Al in St. Albert, then we need to be leading by example. And so it's, uh, to me, that's important. Uh, and, and my other question over the weekend was why now? We, we've been in this pandemic for five months now and why are masks just coming up as um, a topic, a hot topic in the last, not even full week, but, um, so Alberta has the highest per capita active cases in Canada right now, and its hospitalization rate is on the rise and second only to Quebec. So that's a little scary. And, and I don't see the provincial government slowing down with their relaunch. And so as we're relaunching and people are going to school and are going back out in public, uh, we want to prevent the second um, shutdown. So I much prefer mandatory masks over mandatory shutdown. And that's, that's kind of where my decision making was going to go. Um, and, you know, everybody says that we have such low rates in St. Albert, and we do, but I, I sometimes feel that's a result of the work that our residents have done. And some of it is based on luck. And because I was watching um, the city of Brooks and their numbers turned on a dime, you know, they went from under 30, under 10 cases to over a thousand because of the of the meat packing packing outbreak in less than two weeks. So, so you don't want that to happen in St. Albert. If we were to get an outbreak at AGLC, for example, we would be in 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 significant trouble here in St. Albert. And we and the reaction time to get to get them bylaws in place would be slow and you wouldn't even know about some of the cases for two weeks so just because we don't have a high number of cases now doesn't mean that can't happen in St. Albert so um, that's that's another reason for me voting in favor of this this I get that it's difficult based on science um, and I did I do like making my decisions based on evidence you all received probably many emails over the weekend that had links to different 
bodies of research and it's all over the map. And so, but, and they completely contradict each other. So the fact that Percy said at the very beginning of his presentation that there's limited evidence of harm uh, from masks makes me say, let's be better safe than sorry. And uh, a lot, so I don't know if you guys noticed Facebook posts I had on the weekend. Um, I'm going to pull it up. The numbers I had on that post, 20, almost 27,000 people that post reached. I've had over a thousand comments on just the Facebook post and it's been shared 72 times. So I haven't even read the comments on those 72 shares. Some of them I did. Um, overwhelmingly in favor of mandatory masks, not just in transit and not just in city facilities, but in all indoor public spaces, overwhelmingly. And those that said no, they were worried about what are you going to do in a restroom? What are you going to do if I have a disability? Well, we're going to build in exemptions to probably cover off some of those no votes. And then I also put the, a real poll on Twitter, almost 500 votes, 68 and a half percent in favor of mandatory masks in all indoor places. So I'm kind of getting into a, a separate debate, but if it's in favor, if we have public support there, I think we'll have public support for what we're doing today. And of course, I recognize that this is not statistically valid, but getting a thousand votes is a, is a significant um, number. So I think we really need to also do some education to recognize and remind people that wearing a mask does not absolve you of uh, keeping your distance, washing your hands and staying home if you're sick. That, that's, that's one of my fears. And um, so one might argue that fear and anxiety um, is, is driving this and I'm actually okay with that driving force. If there is fear and anxiety in our community, it's our job to try to alleviate that. So Councillor Hansen, I appreciate you bringing this forward and uh, I'll let you close. Thank you, um, everybody. And thank you, Madam Mayor. And also, honestly, thank you to um, our great staff that have gotten this together so quickly. Um, my, um, I won't say very much except that it is our job to make decisions for the greater good of this community. And uh, I think wearing a mask is part of that three-step process of, of washing your hands, physical distancing, and wearing a mask. I mean, these are things that will help um, spread this deadly disease. And while it is maybe more deadly for our seniors, it's we have seen it's deadly for all age groups and nobody is immune to um, the side effects later on in life if you get this. So we really need to stop the spread if we can. Um, we're opening up our, our uh, we're going into phase three. Schools are opening. Uh, we're asking people not to stay home now to come out and support. And I think this is the prudent step to um, to being out in the public. So the best is if, if you stay home and don't go anywhere, but the next prudent step is to get out and minimize the risk of transmitting this disease. So um, all that to say, um, I think this is a really good choice for our community. Um, I think that people will appreciate and feel a relief that there's an expectation, at least in city facilities, that we wear a mask and that we protect each other and we keep our distance. So um, thanks for all the comments and uh, I look forward to seeing a bylaw. All right, I'm calling for the vote. Um, all those in favor? Councillor Hughes? I'm opposed. Okay, so I have Councillor Hughes opposed, Councillor Broadhead in favor, Hanson in favor, Councillor Jolly in favor, Councillor Watkins? In favor, okay, and I'm in favor. So that's a five to one. Uh, so we're gonna have to schedule a special council meeting for August 4th um, to review the bylaw and, and hopefully, Mr. O'Flower, we can give it three readings on the fourth. That's correct, yes. Okay. All right, um, now, before we go any further, is there any thoughts about mandatory indoor masks in businesses? We're, we're not doing it today, but do you want to have the bylaw ready in case we want to pull the trigger September 1st or any other time? Or do you want to 
just leave it for now and discuss it at another time. Councillor Hansen. Uh, well, we do know that um, Jennifer McCurdy is meeting with her board this Wednesday. So I would I'd say let's um, let's listen to what they have to say and, and find out what the engagement um, they've had specifically with uh, their business community. And I think that will inform us to a later discussion and, and a possible bylaw. But I think in this case, it'll be really important to work with the chamber. Okay. Councillor Jolly, did I see you want, wanting to say something? You know what, I, I suspect I, you know, my question about can we move quickly if we need to, um, it, it sounds like we can move quickly. It doesn't really have to be prepared in advance. Okay. Um, Councillor Hughes, I see you unmuted yourself. Did you want to jump in? Uh, no, I think you probably know where I stand on that. I am wondering one question, though, which is, when did you call the special council meetings? I didn't receive any correspondence about it. I just got the Zoom invite. And normally uh, we get correspondence and you declare it. I emailed everyone on Thursday or Friday and then signed the call and then that went out to council on Friday, I think. Hmm. I didn't receive it, oh, that's all. Amira said it was Thursday evening. I just checked my emails, I didn't get it. So anyway, so that was it. Um, all right, and so council, if we're not gonna take that step further, I agree with Councillor Hansen about the chamber's uh, comments and we should probably ask them to provide us with comments. Uh, Edmonton is having the debate on Wednesday and my correspondence with the mayor of Edmonton says that he's, he's pretty sure it will pass in Edmonton, but we can wait to see what they do. So I'll just kind of let it sit and I'm, I will look for any of you to maybe bring forward a request to do it. Um, and then I could call a special council meeting when needed. Oh, Cheryl wants to know what time on the 4th. Do we have to do that right now, Cheryl? I think we can get uh, Elena to find a time that works for everybody because she has access to everyone's calendars. Does that work? Okay. All right. Um, I think that's it. Anything else? Seeing nothing. Uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you, guys.